Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. When we first heard about the next generation of consoles, we heard an awful lot about upsampling. And of course, the current generation of PC graphics cards are also pushing this as well, particularly in video with DLSS or Deep Learning Super Sampling. For Microsoft, their uh, framework though is Direct ML or Direct Machine Learning. You can kind of think of it though as a framework which could be used for a plethora of things. I've discussed Direct ML a number of times now on the channel, but it could be used for, yes, upsampling, but also other things such as advanced AI. And it's a really cool topic. But there is a new job posting, well actually two job postings from Microsoft, which show that the company are doubling or tripling or whatever you want to say, their efforts in this area. And obviously the prime beneficiary of this would be the Xbox series of systems as well as of course their cloud uh, offerings as well. But it does also have very interesting ramifications for PC gaming, and we'll get in more into those in just a moment. But let's have a quick look at the job uh, openings. I want to give uh, credit to TechSpot for this uh, discovery. But again, there are two job openings. So the first is a senior software engineer, and the second is a principal software engineer. These are both for graphics. And if we have a quick mosey over to the description, it says that it implements machine learning algorithms in graphics software to delight millions of gamers. And basically, they're going to work closely with their partners, although they don't really explicitly mention what those partners are, to obviously you know achieve these goals now what's really important here is that partners could mean well of course a game studio so let's take, talk about ubisoft the coalition first and third party studios but also it could mean companies such as amd as well as nvidia and of course nvidia have been very 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 much wanting to get dlsl dlss excuse me to the masses in fact mid this month we're going to see red dead redemption 2 get dlss support unfortunately there's no hardware based ray tracing which is kind of sad because the game if you're running a high-end gpu anyway hits like you know 100 frames a second or whatever so i would have kind of liked for dlss as well as rt to have been you know incorporated but that's a, a topic in and of itself but getting back to the main point here, this is going to be very curious to see how all of this plays out, particularly given that FSR has now come to the market. Microsoft have been very vocal of its support for FSR, Fidelity Super Resolution, and I have to say that I do think that it's a pretty good technology from AMD. We also know that the PlayStation 5 supports this but not because Sony have confirmed it, of course, because that would be too helpful. Instead, a developer has confirmed that FSR does work on not only the PS5, but also the PS4 and Xbox One, which, yeah, that's interesting, although I'm not surprised because the older generation of um, consoles, they are well within the remit of GPUs, which, given they're based on desktop architectures, and AMD's desktop arch architecture, such as like the Xbox One X was essentially Polaris and the PS4 Pro was basically Polaris with a few Vega-esque features. So again, FSR did work on uh, those desktop GPUs. And you know what, I've got a lot of thoughts on this. To my understanding, no game at the moment on the Xbox Series X supports Direct ML. It is a feature which is coming in the future. There may be one or two games at the moment which somewhat utilize the geometry engine of the PlayStation 5. Uh, probably a more first-party studios games, like I think maybe Ratchet and Clank, but certainly not to its full extent. And much the same for Microsoft and Mesh Shaders. Maybe there's one or two games which have somewhat used Mesh Shaders, but it does require... It requires a lot of rethinking in terms of reauthoring the assets if you're trying to do like a 4K update, for example. It's not just easy to be like, oh, okay, well, textures go brr. You have to you have to do a lot to kind of use mesh shaders. And I have spoken quite in depth to uh, NVIDIA and I put out a mesh shader video. So I'll try to remember to link that in the video description as a couple of NVIDIA engineers were working with me to kind of make sure all of that was technically accurate. But getting back to the point here, upsampling is going to be key. At the end of the day, you know, resolutions are increasing exponentially. We all know that, um, you know, games now are much more demanding. And let's face it, 4K, 30 hertz is not great. Like, it's okay for slower paced games, but now we're starting to see 
um, some pretty good reconstruction techniques like obviously uh, the PlayStation 5 has been really using a lot of checkerboard rendering or variants thereof and Microsoft too have been pushing its own stuff. So I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out, especially given how uh, NVIDIA could react. Again, if you have a software, which DirectML essentially is, or it's an API, um, which is basically platform agnostic, i.e. it would run on uh, NVIDIA GPUs, AMD GPUs, consoles, albeit you would probably have to do some optimization around them, of course, it does somewhat eat into the NVIDIA Pi. And I'm gonna be very interested to see how this plays out. I also will be super curious to see how FSR improves. I recently had kind of an exclusive regarding FSR and I do think that AMD's um, strategy going forward, I'm gonna call it FSR2, I don't know what the official name will be, is also going to require, um, somewhat use like machine learning, but in a very different method for how it trains its networks versus NVIDIA. Again, oh, you can check that video out. But I don't know, guys, like, it's it's going to be weird because at this point, it kind of feels like we're entering, like, a new... like, a new arms race. I don't, I don't know if that makes any sense. But, like, all of these different standards, and I, you know, I, I guess it's kind of like we're going to really see who comes out on top. And one thing about Microsoft, of course, is they do have an awful lot of control over a huge amount of the ecosystem. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, at the end of the day, my, my whole thing is that I want the games to look as good as possible. DLSS 2 has now evolved, of course, a couple of versions. I think it's like 2.2 is the latest, and it looks pretty damn good. And we're starting to see some really good implementations of it, like Doom Eternal looks pretty good. But yeah, I'm going to be very interested. Uh, to see how this p plays out over the next like six to 12 months. I think that that's going to be critical. Um, but speaking actually of NVIDIA, a quick story. So this actually concerns RTX 30 Super laptops, but it does make me very suspicious going forward for desktop graphics cards as well, because there were a lot of rumors earlier this year and even late last year that we would eventually see a super series of desktop uh, GPUs. Now, let's quickly look at the uh, super series of mobile parts. So this information comes to us via Greymon55, and there have been a pretty uh, accurate leaker in the past. Now, of course, any leak could be inaccurate, could be accurate, so, you know, do take with a pinch of salt. However, his leak is actually, well basically the latest in a long line of leaks to say that there will be a 30 super series and anyway he says that the laptop versions of rtx uh, super series will be available early next year and there has also been a leak via reddit and you can see it on screen yourself rtx 3060 8 gigabyte gddr6 there's a 3070 super and a 3080 super now of course keeping to the mobile segment for a moment before we analyze desktop a super series does make sense because there is still some room to grow in terms of the specification and we're not a hundred percent certain what nvidia are doing to the specs versus the vanilla series it's possible for example there will be some improvements maybe on the node although again that's only speculation on my part and that also of course means that if we do see desktop parts what actually would happen because at least the rumours that were floating around is that we would see the 3060, 70 and 80 all receive supers, but the, you know, 3080 Ti and 3090, I mean, they would basically remain as is. But does that mean that they are going to be retired? Because, it's, for example, is the 3080 super going to be so close to the 3080 Ti or maybe even exceeding the 3080 Ti? Honestly, no one knows at this point. And again, the question is, are, is there going to be any difference in the process node? My, my personal guess is that at the very, very least, NVIDIA are going to probably retire some of their SKUs um, on their desktop. That's if these parts do launch. And again, to my understanding, speaking to a couple of people, the plan is that they will launch these parts. The thing is that things are so kind of up in the air at the moment for so many obvious reasons like not only are you kind of dealing with the shortages which are starting to get better but what you don't want is like to release a series of graphics cards when 
the supply chain is just absolutely murdered anyway. Like, that, that just doesn't do any good. Um, like, what's the point? And also, of course, it does depend on other factors, like how competitive AMD are at the time, and also if there are any delays on their own products coming forward. So it's going to be very strange to see how NVIDIA respond about this going forward. You know what, the, the graphics market at the moment, despite all of the shortages and frustrations, I have to say, it's a very interesting couple of generations. Like, since the RTX 20 and RX... 5000 series, I have to say that both AMD and NVIDIA are making some very interesting decisions. I'm very, I'm very, very, very happy actually with the progress we're starting to see in the graphics market, particularly given the competitiveness now of AMD. And it's hard to, it's hard to dispute that a lot of the actions we're seeing from NVIDIA are because AMD are being much more competitive. Yes, their ray tracing performance isn't quite there, but their raster performance and also the fact that they are getting, you know, they're getting basically a free PR win simply because of their VRAM. Uh, you know, it's it's a very interesting thing to see in video. Not so much on the back foot, because at the end of the day, the RTX 30 series definitely does hold its own. But it's at the very least like a very... Um, it, it, you know what the best way of just saying it is that at the very least we now have a very compelling alternative from AMD. And now I do want to also cover a small amount of Intel news. And uh, this one, well, yeah, Pat Gelsinger is really getting the old team back together. So for quite a while, there were a number of major departures over at Intel. And this, you know, obviously at the end of the day, people leave, they go to different companies, and then they might come back to a, com a company or they might retire or whatever else. But for quite a while, there was like, I wouldn't call it a dream team, but there was an awful lot of really good engineers that were working at Intel. And obviously we started to see these really impressive architectures that were releasing. You know, Sandy Bridge was a really good one. And then of course, uh, Intel Skylake. And one of the key individuals who was responsible for Skylake has actually returned to Intel. Pat Gelsinger released a tweet to tell us that a 28-year veteran of the industry has returned to Intel, and they are really one of the big reasons that Skylake released. Now, I know that Skylake did kind of become a meme towards the end of its life, but ultimately, when it released, it was a really big deal. In fact, you can even argue that the 8700K and the 9900K, for example, were really great processors. Even the 10900K, which is actually what I'm running in that system as kind of like my daily driver, is really good. Um, but of course, at the end of the day, they were using what was essentially quite an old architecture at that point to try and compete against like Zen 2 and Zen 3, which obviously were AMD's latest and greatest. But getting to the news itself, Shlomit, I'm hopefully I've pronounced that correctly. Um, if not, I really apologize. But Shlomit Weiss, who is uh, now returning to Intel, and they will be leading Intel's consumer ch uh, chip development and design. So previously, she was actually at um, Melanix and also a senior uh, VP of Silicon Engineering. So to be really honest with you, to say that she's an industry veteran is to really kind of undersell her experience and knowledge. Like, yeah, she's quite a force in the industry. Now, at the end of the day, even if she kind of starts designing a chip from the ground up right now, it's going to take a long time for it to mature and actually, well, become a product because we all know that, you know, silicon bring ups take absolutely forever. However, that was a really terrible way to go into a next sentence, but whatever. Um, however, when we look at possibly her helping some of the current projects, there's possibly a less, you know, a quicker turnaround for her exp experience at Intel to be actually used properly. And yeah, um, Intel have been in kind of a very difficult spot. I kind of don't envy Intel's marketing department, frankly, um, for the last couple of years because it must have been extremely difficult, especially with like Rocket Lake, like. Emerging being the person that was trying to push Rocket Lake. And, you know, Rocket Lake did have a few nice SKUs, at least in my personal opinion. I think some of the lower end SKUs were pretty good. Um, and I think the 11900 could have been good, actually, if they'd have made some changes to it. But obviously, that's water under the bridge and it's kind of gone out into the ocean at this point. 
However, going forward, Intel does need to make some major changes. Let's be honest, the fact that they are now apparently going to be using TSMC, they're apparently going to be one of the big clients of the free NM process of TSMC, they're going to be kind of breaking it in along with Apple, which, well, that, that will be curious. Technically speaking, they could actually have a process lead over AMD, at least for a short period of time. But over, you know, over that, it's just kind of weird because we're in this kind of transition period at the moment for Intel. It almost feels like they're trying to, I don't know, reinvent themselves. And I feel that Intel as a company have somewhat stagnated, but I actually feel somewhat bad for some of the individuals who are there because, you know, Intel does have some really, really talented people. And, you know, all of the companies do. Let's just be honest, AMD, NVIDIA, like, yeah, it's it's kind of ridiculous. And Intel have had this thing of being behind previously. Remember when AMD were just kicking the snot out of them with like the early Athlons and Athlon 64s and they were trying to compete with like uh, Pentium 4 and NetBurst. It wasn't so good when it was, you know, really like, uh, yeah, let's not really talk about Pentium 4 and NetBurst, shall we? Bad memories all around. But yeah, it, it, it just didn't quite live up to the expectation of the clock frequencies, obviously, that Intel had hoped and it didn't scale as well. So Intel have been in this position before, but arguably AMD are now running away with this a lot more. And I think that, um, you know, Pat getting the, you know, the old crew back together, uh, along with, of course, the new talent that they've got, maybe Intel can start to turn things around. But I don't think we're really going to have a good understanding until like Older Lake comes out, how Intel will fare in the next couple of years. I do have a feeling Older Lake is going to be decent. The problem that uh, Intel have is that AMD are going to be releasing, of course, their Ryzen V cache, which is ridiculous given it's basically, you know, pretty much all Ryzen V cache is. And I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but it's basically just taking Zen 3 and then slapping a whole amount of RAM on it or cache on it. That's basically what AMD have done. It's like, oh, here's free, you know, here's like, what is it, 12%, 15% improvement in performance. You know, if you're Intel, you've got to just be somewhat ready to cry on that. Just, yeah. And then, obviously, we're going to see Zen 4 release, and Zen 4 is going to be just absolutely ridiculous as well. And it does seem that Zen 4 is going to be more designed to compete not with Alder Lake, but with Raptor Lake, as I've discussed previously. So, I think Intel are going to have a very hard time over the next couple of years. The good news is, though, you know, in the long term, they're going to be okay but they are certainly going to be irrelevant in a couple of product segments. And I think that the one that they might be hurting in most, at least in my personal opinion, might actually be servers. But yeah, there's a reason that Lisa is diverting some of their tier SMC allocation to produce extra server chips because they know they are hitting Intel really hard there at the moment. With all of that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. If you've enjoyed it, you know what to do. Leave a likey on the video and also subscribe if you want more of me for whatever reason. And I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.